When flying an airplane with a crosswind, it is necessary to angle the nose of the airplane into the wind to avoid being blown off course. This angle is called the drift angle, and it is crucial for a navigator to know exactly what the drift angle is in order to accurately plot and navigate courses. There are two types of drift meters that were commonly used in World War II to assist with this. The first here is a B5 drift meter. It is actually quite simple. It consists of an eyepiece which focuses on prisms and mirrors to give a view of the ground. And it has a set of grids here on a little wooden circle which rotate underneath a frosted glass plate. Here is a pencil resting in its holder, but which may be moved. And this is connected on the inside to a small pointer. When looking through the eyepiece, you're also looking through this piece of glass with lines etched on it called a gradical. And these lines are exactly parallel to the lines on the rotating wooden disc and these two are connected so that as you adjust the grid lines here you can see that the gradical lines are adjusted in the same manner as the navigator would appear through the eyepiece he would see objects coming across in this direction and tracking along in the gradical the navigator would sit at his station and look into the drift meter in this orientation but the airplane is flying in this direction and the nose of the aircraft is pointed in this direction. In the first clip you will see what it looks like if there was no crosswind and the airplane is flying without a drift correction and the ground track is completely parallel to the lines in the gradical. Next you will see what it looks like when there is a crosswind and a drift angle has been established. Looking through the eyepiece, we now see that ground objects are tracking at an angle compared to the gradical lines. By moving the pointer looking through the eyepiece here the navigator would actually inscribe lines with his pencil on this frosted glass case This leaves several tracing pencil marks on the glass plate. And when the grid is rotated so that the pencil marks are aligned and parallel to the grid, this tells you that the drift is 20 degrees to the left. The drift meter can also be used to calculate ground speed. By looking through the eyepiece, there are two lines oriented at right angles to the grid lines on the reticle called timing lines. When an object passes the first timing line, a stopwatch is started, and when it crosses the second timing line, the stopwatch is stopped. This gives you a time in seconds, and using the altitude, the ground speed can be determined. Here we will see a building with a green roof, and we will watch as it crosses the right timing line, at which point we will begin timing until it reaches the left timing line. That was about seven seconds. <clears throat> and so we use this little computer here, and since we're at 5,000 feet, we'll put seven seconds next to 5,000 feet. And that gives us an airspeed in knots of about 210 knots. 
This much larger and more cumbersome device is a B3 drift meter. It is far more complicated than the B5 drift meter and is composed of an upper housing which has a gyroscope which stabilizes a lighted reticle or grid lines and it is connected to a shaft which in this case is about 27 inches long although later models were even longer. The upper portion rotates in azimuth as the reticle is oriented to correct for drift and this establishes the drift angle. To demonstrate this it has to be mounted and suspended and we're going to put this into a table cut just for that purpose. The B3 drift meter had a lot of working parts. It ran off of 110 volt 400 hertz single phase alternating current. Most modern airplanes today run off of 110 volt 400 hertz three phase current but back then they were using single phase and finding a 110 volt 400 hertz single phase power supply was something of a challenge. But we found a small model here made in China and available on Amazon. The drift meter consisted of an eyepiece and by rotating the lower portion this actually unscrewed and raised it up and allowed you to focus it. There was a rheostat for illuminating the reticle, a small little light bulb here. There is a gyroscope in this big housing here and the gyroscope clutch is here. This would be pulled out to uncage the gyro and that would be in the uncaged position. Moving it back would cage the gyro. Here is the on off switch for the gyroscope. This is where the 110 volt AC current comes in. And there is a handle over here which is attached to a cable to the lower lens. This is normally set at zero, but can be rotated 15 degrees forward or 87 degrees to the rear. There are detents at 70.9 and 50 degrees as well as zero. This allowed the navigator to search out ahead or to look behind. Finally, these specific detents would allow the navigator to obtain ground speed information by starting a timer at zero and stopping it at 50 or by starting it at 50 and rotating to 70.9. When the object would be seen to cross the center line of the reticle at zero, the stopwatch would be started. This would then be rotated to 50 and when the object came into view again and crossed the center line a second time the stopwatch would be stopped and there were formulas to allow ground speed to be computed doing this. Likewise you could set it at 50 and when the object crossed the center line at 50 the stopwatch was started. This would then be rotated to 70 and when the object then crossed the center line again the stopwatch would be stopped. Finally, there is a azimuth scale with compass headings on it and a measurement of drift which goes from 0 to 20 degrees on either side. The entire assembly could be rotated freely by moving this knob to this position this allowed the entire assembly to rotate but typically what was done is that the knob would be in the forward position and it would be rotated for fine adjustment back and forth to get the reticle centered up to correct for drift. There was a small sunshade if the ground reflection was too bright. Finally there was an extra eyepiece here which magnified to three power and this could be placed up here in place of the single power lens. 
Our power supply is now up and running at 400 Hertz and we will turn the gyroscope on. It will need to be up and running for about five minutes before we begin using it. The gyroscope runs at about 10,600 RPM. Now the gyroscope is at full speed. The gyroscope stabilizes the reticle vertically as you can see here. The ball assembly rotates at approximately 40 RPM, and you can see the ball in its track here. If the gyroscope tilts to one side, the ball travels faster on the downhill portion of its cycle and slower on the uphill portion of its circuit. This means it spins longer on the uphill portion of its track and this means more downward pressure on the upward tilted side which returns it to level. In the first clip we will see a situation with no crosswind or drift correction established. An object from the ground will travel in a straight line from top to bottom. In the next video, we'll see what it looks like with a drift angle established. The objects are drifting at a diagonal angle across the viewfinder, and then the reticle is illuminated, and then the upper portion is turned to orient the reticle parallel to the track of the ground objects. This gives us a drift angle of about 10 degrees to the right. There were two ways to calculate ground speed using this drift meter. The first is very similar to what we saw in the B5 drift meter demonstration. An object is tracked as it crosses the upper line on the reticle or first line and timed until it reaches the third line or the lower line on the reticle. In the following clip, we'll see the same building with a green roof as it begins its course down the viewfinder and start the stopwatch as it crosses the very first line and stop the watch as it crosses the third line. That took approximately 5.2 seconds. The formula for calculating ground speed is to take the altitude times a constant and divide that by the time, yielding ground speed. The constant for this drift meter is 0 0.177. The time was 5.2 seconds. Our altitude is 6,000 feet. So 6,000 times 0 0.177 over 5.2 gives us a ground speed of 204 knots. The second way to calculate ground speed sounds more complicated as in the introduction, but actually was somewhat easier. We'll use the same building with a green roof and see when it crosses the center line at zero degrees. We will then switch to 50 degrees and we will wait until that same green building comes into line and crosses the center line, at which point we will stop timing. That time was almost exactly 10 seconds. The formula for using this method 
is to take altitude times the constant over time, which gives ground speed. The constant for this method is 0 0.76 for this drift meter. The time was 10 seconds, the altitude 3,000 feet. So 3,000 times 0 0.76 divided by 10 gives us a ground speed of 228 knots.